Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to Leading Agile Sound Notes. This week, we're going to talk all about sprint reports and what you should include and why you should include it and what you should not include. And Jessica is going to run the interview because she's working in metrics and I'm just a guy that makes up weird reports. But before we get into that, Jessica, thank you for being here today. No problem. It's a pleasure being here. Now, she's taking a break from a lot of important things going on that are outside of work and she's not wearing green today, which is kind of a shocker. <laughs> she's got to show support for a team. So what's going on outside of work? Outside of work, the Philadelphia Eagles beat the Atlanta Falcons. And any of you who are Eagles fans know how big of a deal this is, especially because Carson Wentz is uh, hurt. We've got Foles, who is really – he's leading the team. Our defense won that game. But um, for some of you who don't know, a lot of our company is from Georgia. Specifically around Atlanta. Almost all of the company. <laughs> and it's so funny that the only thing I heard as far as football this year is that that college game with. Well, they're uh, all about college football. They don't care about yeah. college football. And I didn't hear anything about the Falcons game, and I'm just elated that. So I'm going to bet you. I'm going to place a better. I'm going to bet you ten dollars right now that okay. the Eagles choke. <sighs> In the that was my no button. In the next round. Yeah. The Eagles choke in the next round. I don't, I don't think even they... I swore off the Eagles in seventh grade. I'm never going back. They... I So we've got home field advantage. Um, we're playing the Vikings. I, I would have rather played the Saints. I think we would have done better. But, um, yeah. So for those of you who are agilists like us who love football, I hope that you liked that uh, uh, introduction to this podcast. <laughs> and those of you who don't pay any attention to football – I just bet money on a football game. All right. Now, let's talk about sprint reports. So you work in metrics. Maybe you should, we should give them a little background for folks who aren't familiar with you. What, what yeah. is the focus of your job? So my role here at Leading Agile is senior ALM tooling consultant. So what that means is that we work with the transformation teams to set up the tools in order to get the metrics that you need to facilitate the transformation. So in Leighton's terms, what questions might you have as you're going through and doing your work, right? So what we want to do is provide the metrics that support the answers to those questions. Okay. That makes sense. Makes total sense. So brand new team, let's say companies just getting started with Scrum. Um, like if I go into night teach a CSM class, one of the things that it doesn't say in the Scrum Guide is that you have to include a sprint report, but I always show one in class and I'll, I'll put up the screenshot right now of the one I have. That I, yep. which is more complex than anybody's sprint report that I've ever seen. But I would like to know from you as somebody who focuses on metrics, like what are the basic things that companies should include in a sprint report if they're going to do that? So actually what you've included here is pretty good. Um, but it really depends on where the company's at and what things they need to see. So for this, if we're looking at just predictability, not bad, but I'd, I'd want to understand more specifics. So when we talk about the work planned, right, or it looks like you're talking about the number of items. I don't understand the size of those items. So that is actually in the first uh, column, it might be the number of cards, but we switched over to points partway through. <laughs> oh, no, actually, sorry. In this report, no, it is just cards. It is just cards. We didn't estimate the items in this class. You're yeah. Right. So one thing that you also want to make sure that when you're doing this is you want to, whether you use points, cards, whatever it is, in order to understand what your trends are, you want to keep it consistent, right? So if you do start with points, I recommend to stay with points unless there is something that is um, inherent that is preventing you from really being accurate on those points. I shouldn't say accurate. Being consistent, being able to actually do that. So, so let me explain something about this class and see how yeah. this resonates with you. So in this particular, in what you're looking at in this picture, um, there's new learning objectives for the Scrum courses from the Scrum Alliance, and I had never taught them before. So what I told the students was, I can't estimate the work, one, because I don't know how many questions you're going to ask. Two, because to be honest with you, even though I know how to teach this class, I've never taught to these learning objectives before. I know what they are, but I don't know what's going to happen when we do it. So I didn't feel comfortable estimating the work. And we just started working through it, you know, kind of seeing what would happen. If it's mm -hmm. a brand new team that doesn't have like a point of reference, has not worked together before, is it bad to just start out without estimating work and just see how many things you can do? 
Well, it's a great time to start with a story pointing exercise, actually. So one that I... One that I like to use is, because you always want to create a frame of reference for something you can agree on and something that you know. So if your point range is, you know, one through, let's say you don't want to do anything above a 13, right? Yeah. We're talking about Fibonacci sequence for those of you who um, aren't familiar with story points. Uh, one, two, three, five, eight, and then 13. Um, and then you could go higher than that. Um, a lot of times when I'm w working with a team, I try to discourage going higher than that unless absolutely necessary um, but you want to have a frame of reference so everybody on the team agrees on what a five is everyone on our team agrees on what a one is what a 13 is so this way you have that frame of reference so and when you're talking one second when you say points you're t how do you define a point is it just time is it other stuff too uh, it can't just be time right okay it's, so what else so you're looking at time you're looking at effort and you're looking at complexity right okay so it's funny because I actually, and we can talk about this more in next podcast, but um, I'm doing story points for my personal Kanban. And I don't just look at time and complexity and effort. I also look at motivation for my personal Kanban of, okay. you know, how long is it going to take, how much effort is it going to take me to get motivated to actually get off my butt and do this thing that is on my personal Kanban? Um, okay. Not to say that you need to do that on your team, but um, just as an example. Well, and I, and I usually use risk complexity and effort, but the thing is it doesn't, I, I would say it doesn't matter as long as it's more than just hours, right? Yeah. In fact, I like to take hours out of the equation um, just in the term of that story because you break things down into tasks and tasks to me make more sense to put hours on. But even when you're doing hours, I don't like to say how long do I think it's going to take me to do this, but how how much time am I going to dedicate before I reevaluate? So okay. I'm going to say I'm going to work on um, building this. I'm going to say cabinet just to, to, for a frame of reference. I'm in my kitchen and I looked at the cabinet. I'm going to work on building this cabinet for the next two hours. And then from there, I'm going to reassess to okay. see how much longer I think it might take it or how much longer I'm going to dedicate to working on that. So okay. this way I'm not giving you um, an estimate of how long I think it's going to take. I'm going to tell you how much time I'm going to take on it. Okay. So that's basically the point idea. We can come mm -hmm. back to that maybe in another podcast, but what do you want to know at the end of a sprint when a team is just getting started out? Like, what do you think is worth talking about with the stakeholders in the sprint review? Okay. So if we go to the leading agile model, teams backlog and working tested software. So number one, the team retrospective are, is the process working for them? Um, are they gelling as a team backlog? Do they have enough backlog and is it clear for them to continue to move forward? Working tested software, can I actually show the thing? Is it demoable? Is it working? Has it been tested? Do we have testing plans? Things of that sort. So when we're looking at the sprint review, number one, did we do what we said we're going to do? Right. Does it work? <clears throat> and are we working on the right thing? So when I look at your sprint report, I think it's great on saying this is predictable. But one thing that might actually help um, – is you said that the uh, Scrum Alliance has new categories, right? Yeah, yep. So a thematic approach. So what things am I working on and what percentage of time am I working on each theme? And what allocation okay. am I putting on those themes? So if we're looking at a scaled approach, right, this is the delivery team level. Sure. But at a program level in an organization, we may not necessarily, like these things are important, but when it comes to the evaluation of the big scheme of things, are we doing the right thing for the big picture? So what percentage of our team's time is spent on technical debt? What is spent on new development? What is spent on keeping the lights on work? Things like that. Exactly. Right. And then um, at that level, are we predictable to say that we're going to spend this much time on these things? Did we actually spend that much time on those things? And we're looking at budget allocation for that, too, when we're talking about time. Okay. So do you normally include financial reporting of some kind with, with stuff like this? At the portfolio level, yes. Not at the okay. delivery team level. Don't okay. want to get them involved in the money. But we want to understand how much does it cost for our delivery team to work within you know, a sprint, right? And then how much right. is that sprint? What is that work that's in that sprint? So not necessarily how many hours they're taking on it, but we know how much they get paid. We know how long they work in a day. So, 
Okay. All right. If that makes sense. Yeah. So that totally makes sense. So one of the things in this report that I'm also trying to track, if you look where the delta symbols are, I've got delta in percent of forecast met since last time, delta in velocity, delta in average velocity. That is me trying to understand the trending of the team over time. And I'm <laughs> trying to look, and it does go back to predictability. Like, what what are they, what's the gap between what we planned we were going to do and what we said we were going to do? Um, are we stabilizing in terms of velocity and percent of forecast met? What kind of things do you like to look at when teams are getting started out to understand like their basic health across a number of sprints? Yeah, the velocity variance, so your average velocity delta, um, is definitely important. We want to understand um, what that looks like and also be able to explain it. We might have an uh, increase or decrease that's expected depending on what might be happening. So let's say that our velocity went down um, based on our last sprints, but maybe we had a few people out or maybe there was a holiday, right? So we want to be able to explain okay. that. Maybe our velocity went up, but we had extra help that sprint or, or whatnot. <clears throat> so okay. looking at those things to be able to say that. Now, percent of forecast met, uh, I, I um, this is- That's me trying to explain plan versus accepted. Yeah, so I think what's more important is work added during the sprint and work removed during the sprint because you can add something and remove something, but there could be no change as far as the delta when we're looking at the big picture. Yeah, right? yeah. So, uh, and then it, from a metric standpoint, we may have completed the number of points or completed the number of items that we said we complete, but they weren't the items that we said we would complete. Right. We would not, maybe, maybe we didn't meet the commitment, but we got the same volume of stuff done. That is, so one of the things that often happens in classes is by about the third sprint, they're so freaked out. They're like, let's just do as much as we can. And I'm like, what's your sprint goal? Do lots of things. Um, how do you <laughs> avoid things like that when you're, when you're working with new teams? I mean, it's going back to the clarity of the backlog, understanding what is important to do right now. So there's a difference between priority and urgency, right? So something yeah. might be urgent to say, oh, you know, I got this request right now. This email came in and they want us to do this, but we haven't prioritized it. Just because it's an urgent thing to respond to doesn't mean we should work on it right now. Okay. Does that make right. sense? It totally does. So um, one, I want to ask you another question about this. So this this report is one that came, I came up with on my own. I was doing Scrum a long time ago in a very hostile waterfall organization, an impossible project. Like it was going to take literally four extra years of time to finish all the work they wanted. And mm -hmm. this report was basically my way of having the data I needed to walk through the story of why in the last two boxes at the bottom of the column, I could say, look, if you really have to have everything, this is how much longer you have to pay for people to be here. If you have to hit the deadline, this is how much you're gonna miss. Um, it's all kind of a setup for me to be able to get there. When you're working with companies and helping them set up metrics and stuff, I'm assuming the approach is different than for me. It's always like you as a scrum master or PO have to tell a story. What kind of defensive tools do you need to be able to do that and come out alive? Um, how do you approach things like that with, with new companies trying to figure out like what you can have, what you can't have? So I like to take a top-down approach, right? And understand what's important at each layer and break that down into smaller pieces. So okay. from a governance standpoint and then from a product standpoint. So let's say that we have these things we're doing in a sprint, right? But on the program level, each one of these things represents a different feature. We've got too much work in progress then, right? So okay. if we're not... If we're not, um, even though we might be looking busy, um, we're working on all different things at the same time. And in order to get one feature complete, if we're not actually putting all the effort, um, swarming, if you will, around sure. that feature to get it done, to get it to move through um, the program level Kanban, then it, there's going to be a lot of work in progress and we're focused on everything, which okay. means we're focused on nothing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah. we, I want to understand here. So let's say that, you know, in sprint one, um, you have, I'm going to say five different objectives from the Scrum Alliance, right? If you're lo looking at each of those five objectives all in sprint one, are you really focusing on finishing any of them? So, okay, let me ask. So I'll tell you what we did in the class. We go through each topic and we actually test each topic against the learning objectives before we move on to the next topic. 
-hmm. And that is part of getting the work accepted. Like part of our definition of done is nothing can be accepted as complete until the whole entire class agrees we've met the learning objectives for that subject. Is so, that something that we need to show separately in here? Or, or, I would. Okay. I would. So you have um, your learning objectives, and then you have the things you're doing to meet those learning objectives. So if you okay. look at it from a product standpoint, maybe your learning objective is a feature, and the things you're doing to meet the completion of that feature are your stories. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Okay. Yeah, and then from there... Then you can look at the end where how much time or should I say how many stories it took for each objective. Okay. So you can break it down. And then, you know, as far as each sprint, what percentage of the amount of items were for each of the uh, objectives, right? Sure. Sure. Okay. This, this is a really important concept because if they can get this, then it's not focusing on being busy. It's focusing on working on the right thing. Yeah. And that's got to be, I mean, that's a tricky thing. Like you can, no matter how you set the metrics up, they're still going to have to be having the conversations about that. Um, Absolutely. And and there's, and I'm imagining that the people that are new to this stuff, you kind of can get kind of drunk with the data and want to see all the kinds of reports they can and, and not necessarily understand what they're for. I mean, how do you, how do you guide people in the beginning with that, where there's so much available to them? Right. So I don't like to start with metrics. I like to start with goals. Okay. And then questions and then put our metrics up. Now, Derek Heather, he has done so many um, podcasts and articles around G GQM. I actually right. recommend um, maybe at the end of this, we can add one of the links to, I think, one of his um, blog posts. Okay. That, um, sure. It's pretty good for GQM. But um, I recommend to actually start with your goal because if we just throw a bunch of metrics out there, you can get lost in, oh, I need to increase my velocity and think that that's a good thing. But in actuality, if you're not working on the right thing, you're just, I would say, putting the wrong thing through the system faster, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And is it really providing value for what the company actually needs? Okay, cool. So if people want to, to ask you more questions about this, like how to get started with reporting or find out more about the metrics, work that you you and Derek do, um, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Or if they just want to mock you about your foolish hope that the Eagles will survive? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> be careful if you know anything about Eagles fans. Um, on yes, they will throw family. batteries at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was before I was born, to to, to be frank. So I think that we've, we've become a little bit better. Oh, okay, um, we'll update it. They'll tase you if you enter the field. <laughs> And, and uh, I did grow up going to uh, games at Veterans Stadium. So so just be careful mocking the Eagles. I might not be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hurt anybody, though, I promise. Um, so I would say to get in touch with me is jessica.wolf, W-O-L-F-E, at leadingagile.com. Um, or you can get in touch with me on Twitter at the Jessica Wolf. Those are probably the two best spots to get in touch with me. Cool. All right. And I'll make sure to include the link to Derek's uh at the bottom and thank you very much for taking time out of your day for this no problem bye guys see you